Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of Unfolding the Soul. Today, I have Rob as my guest, um, and he's, he's going to have the first repeat topic. So that's going to be really exciting to, to have some contrast there. Um, Rob is going to talk about role-playing games. Um, mm -hmm. I've met him when he came into the Verfeki server trying to figure out a bunch of stuff, I think, with the idea of developing his game in, in the back of his mind. And uh, I and Mark ended up uh, willing to assist in, in this project. So we've been uh, meeting like multiple times, giving Rob suggestions and putting him in a <laughs> maybe a state of disorder trying to refigure re what's what's going on in, in the game mm -hmm. but uh, yeah that that that's how i know rob and uh like i i believe that rob has actually a good thing going with his role playing game and uh, like i i hope he can bring it to a, a nice finish so Thank yeah you. rob role playing games yeah what are, those to you? What are they to me <clears throat> I could start with, I could either start at the beginning or start at the end of that idea. Like to me, in a sense, they are the gateway to the divine because they enable connection in ways that very few other experiences do in a consistent way. I think uh, for people that are really inclined towards a group experience and have been uh, disillusioned for one reason or another with other inclusive group. Well, how would I say it? I, practices. I, 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 practices, but I want to say religious practices, but bracketing the word religion, the, the way Verveke uses it with religio, reconnection. So containers containers uh, made for intimacy <laughs> <laughs> yeah right exactly social intimacy sorry like yeah that. when they're working the best yes mm -hmm. uh so to the extent that they do that uh, i'm pleased with them in my experience very few games actually encourage that and the games that do encourage that i feel they do so in a way that uh doesn't often meet your normal role-playing game guy where they are. And I say guy very specifically because I, I find often that it's, there's men that have real trouble bridging the gap between each other when it comes to expressing themselves. You know, we're very, we're very guarded and oftentimes quite insecure. So, but in spaces- And, and also that, probably oriented differently, right? Like more oriented towards the utilitarian aspect, like how, how can I make it work? Like how can I hack <laughs> the meta game, right? Like right. Yes, there's, there's, this, there's this element, I, I got to beat this and, and, and we get locked in, in that modality real fast. So uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's go to the start. Like, so at the start, yeah. So I started playing RPGs when I was eight. Uh, a friend of mine in, I guess it was third grade, uh, got a bunch of us together and said, well, we're going to play a game and you're going to have a character. And he made the character and we kind of directed like, Hey, what do you want to be? You want to be like a whatever ninja or a wizard or something like that. I picked a ninja cause that sounded cool to me. And um, we gathered at his place and uh, proceeded to play our first role-playing session without really knowing what was going on. Like there wasn't a preface to like, hey, we're all playing pretend and there are rules and stuff like that. He just started, started and like laid out a scene and told us what we saw. And then we sort of said what our characters did. And it was moderately confusing the first time I missed an attack. That was the thing I remember like, wait, what do you mean I missed? Because the dice rolled poorly on my first attack roll. And like, how did I miss? I have this giant thing. He's right in front of me. I'm just swinging as hard as I can. Like, what do you mean I missed? Like something else happened. And there, it, that was that was my first session and also my very first design disconnect mm. because it was like that just disrupted the story for me in a way that I didn't find interesting. I'm I'm fine with interesting disruptions. If it was like 
hey, you hit the guy and it clanged off his armor and it broke a part of your thing and now it's harder for you to hit him. That might might have been interesting, but a simple you missed was like that wasn't enough. <laughs> there was there was it was so denuded of meaning and context that it was confusing to me because like all my other experiences playing pretend up to that point, there was a natural flow of Ooh. story. And you know, when you're playing like when you're eight and you're playing with GI Joes or Star Wars figures or something like that. Yeah, the stormtroopers miss, but it's so they can be defeated, right? There's like a, a, a plan in, in the narrative for them. And to have the hero miss as a result of something random felt like off-putting and weird immediately. Uh, and I didn't realize this until much later, right? This was became, you know, once that happened and that was integrated into the greater experience, then it wasn't weird the next couple of times. Well, it, it was explained like, if you roll over this much, it means you hit. And if you roll under this much, it means you miss. And, you know, this number changes based on what you're attacking. So like a guy who's naked has, is really easy to hit. And a guy with a shield and full plate armor is really hard to hit. And that, that was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So it's not really hit. It's like do something to, right? Have, have effect upon and not hit so much. And so like that that idea has informed so much of my design because it's moved away from the, uh, the default engagement, which is generally attacking something in RPGs <laughs> to, you know, having that as part of the array of the engagements, but that's, you know, that's not particular to my game. It's just something that I, that appears to overly influence other games when you have one tool in your toolkit, then, inevitably players will reach for that tool no matter what the situation so yeah mm -hmm. so a couple things spring out there to me so first it's immediately into to the mechanics right it's like mm -hmm. okay and secondly uh seeing the mechanics be a constraint upon you i think that's like the first time that popped out that the, mm -hmm. the aspect of constraint and then I, I felt like you you needed a justification for the an acceptable justification for the constraint in, in order to participate. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, there was um, it like I said, it was, didn't have any meaning to it. There was no like something I could I could say why this happened or how. It was just a, a fact, and there was no. <laughs> no additional scaffolding whatsoever so it didn't it didn't feel like anything had actually happened it just felt like there was an arbitrary decision and that's oftentimes what the dice are they're arbitrary they're, they're making an arbitrary decision for somebody uh and you know i think that's fine and but i don't i don't i feel like you can do more with dice than just have them be an arbitrator i think it's i think the idea of using dice as um, as an interpretive seed is much more interesting. Like there are games that use symbols on their dice and they have you sort of interpret them um, mm -hmm. or use the numbers in slightly different ways and have interpretations based on that. So like something simple would be um, if you're in a system where you're rolling percentile dice and you're getting a number between one and a hundred, the relative distance away from your target number, good or bad sort of, allows the player or the GM to interpret that result as larger in scope or smaller in scope, right? So like, if you only succeeded by a little bit, then, you know, you, you needed a 50 roll to 51. Well, then, you know, the narrative might be, oh, you just scraped by. Whereas if you rolled a 95, then the narrative might be interpreted as, that, that role might be interpreted as driving the narrative to a place where you smashed whatever goal you were trying to get through, right? Similarly, if you were, uh, if you missed, you rolled a 49 instead of a 50. Well, like the, the whoever's narrating that might say, oh, they barely missed it. And maybe there's a chance to recover or something like that. Whereas if you miss it by like you roll a one or something like that, and then you can narrate that as, as uh, uh, a like, catastrophically wrong, <laughs> like well, horrendously <laughs> your character's dead or whatever, you know. Um, but the idea, the idea being that's, that's an interpretive uh, mapping that that the game is 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 asking you to do, but it's it's introducing uh, 
the human interpretive structure on top of the on top of the mechanic and that's that to me allows for more unpacking of meaning right mm -hmm. so and 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 adding more meaning to whatever just happened the dice roll that just happened so for me in design i try i i like games where the dice rolls are consistently meaningful meaning the game isn't having you roll just to track something or do the equivalent of narrative accounting where it's like, well, how long did it take you to get from here to here? Because we need to know time and we need to know, you know. like in stories, the time is essential only when it matters to the plot, right? Like we don't count hours between chapters or whatever like that. And so when we're creating a story between each other and RPGs, like I find that the moments where the game forces you into accounting mode kicks you out of the story to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on the other hand, right, like you, you had to have been in it in the first place, right? Yeah. I, I think the complaint that you had about guys playing role playing games is that no, they're, they're never in the story mode, right? Like the story <laughs> yes. scaffolding for, for rolling dice. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's fine too. Like I'm, I'm fine with that. If you, if they're, the game is like, let's just see how many orcs we can kill before we die, which is what D and D sometimes is. And that's a, that's fun. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to take away anybody's enjoyment of that particular experience because I've enjoyed that and it's great, but once you've done it enough, then I feel like there's very little to graduate to. Um, you know, games like Fort Blades in the Dark, uh, Apocalypse World, um, games like uh, A Quiet Year, where it's 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 bracketed. You know, it's going to end. Like you know, like most RPGs, D and D included, are, are typically structured open endedly. So you get to the end of the story, and then you immediately go on to another one or have some downtime, or whatever, like that. But in some games, uh, there are, you know, it will say you're going to be done at the end of the session. It's going to take two hours or three hours like that. And at the end, here's the ending. Like your settlement dies. That's the end. Like we know that happens. And then tell us the story that goes up to that, right? Like what went wrong. And then so there's a, there's a narrative unfolding of, of, of how this settlement goes, you know, is extinguished. Um, and it forces you um, through that constraint, right? That's, a, that's an imposed constraint, but it's imposed from the beginning, not during the course of the game. And so because the players are aware of that constraint, well, then it becomes like any other imaginative exercise where you have a sandbox to play in. Suddenly you can bounce, you, you know what, you're, what you can't include. And so that becomes now a more fertile ground for picking ideas out of you know, what, what becomes inspiring. Yeah, so let, let's go back to this eight-year-old kid yeah. with, his, with his first trauma. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, was, was it traumatic? Like, was, was it dis disenchanting in, in a sense that you're like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore? Or were you like... No, it was, first try? it was confusing. It was confusing because I didn't understand why mechanics should have an influence on the story at all. Like, it seemed like they should be doing something else. I'm not sure exactly what... I didn't have, you know, I was eight. <laughs> I, I didn't know any different, but there was something that felt off. So, um, no, it was an enjoyable experience. It was so enjoyable that I, you know, like a significant chunk of my life is devoted towards improving it. You know, like I want to make it better. That's the whole point. Like, so, but so few games do what I want that I'm in the position of being frustrated most of the time when I'm, when I'm doing something that I am supposed to be enjoying. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really yeah. fucked up. Uh, like, like the last, I would say five or six times I played D&D, &D, it was like, oh man. Um, I don't want to say it wasn't fun because there are fun parts, but like I really noticed how badly the game got in the way. You know, and it was like, this isn't helping. Like we should be doing something like we should be using another system at least. And, you know, this kind of story this guy's trying to tell, like is actually being hurt by the fact that 90% of our tools are used to do damage. Like we're, we're help. We're supposed to be like helping people recover from 
an attack and then uh uh like well, one session we were just handling a survivor like that was the whole thing like there was a battlefield he was a lone survivor he was traumatized and like as D, &D characters your only options to to affect the story are role playing and skill checks at that point you have no mechanics in your class very few mechanics in your class to actually like help a traumatized person unless there's a spell where it's just like heal trauma purify <laughs> <Right>? so, <laughs> demons yeah 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 purify demons yeah right whatever it is uh <laughs> restoration well you know take your pick um but it's just like i want it done right you just check the box next to the thing it's like oh then we solved the story and mm -hmm. well no you didn't there was no yeah, so, so so you you you're talking about a change in 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 your modality of of playing and, and maybe that that's nice to to keep in the background of the story like what's what's the modality that you approach the game from so, so you start out as this kid just being excited right and, and trying it out so yeah what's the first significant thing that that you encountered in in relation to role play hmm first significant thing you mean like a really significant experience or um yeah, memorable yeah, right memorable yeah. experience uh let's see hmm. it was it was this the mainly i would say the memorable thing was the sense of regular inclusion mm -hmm. and so that's that's the thing that is has sort of focused my aim the most is um to allow rpgs to be or not rpgs but my rpg to be more inclusive of more different kinds of stories happening at the same time uh because i'm not assuming i'm trying not to assume or trying to scaffold a system that does not assume uh, the players are necessarily interested in the same shit all the time. I'm, I'm interested in um, a, an RPG that allows you to tell a story and scaffolds your ability to tell a story that's similar to something like the Game of Thrones novels, where you have disparate characters um, uh, ha having their own stories and then meeting each other and having moments of significance during those intersections. And so the intersections are where players will, will meet each other and encounter uh, moments of crisis and uh, things of that nature. And then when they're not doing that, they are, they're, they're kind of engaged in their own story, pushing the, the, the narrative along in their own way. Um, but they're not, but since like the table time of that is sort of minimized a little bit, because it, it can be handled um, as you can unpack it to the degree that you want as a player. So if you're not really interested in the how you got there, you're just sort of interested in the uh, what it cost me or, you know, to have this goal achieved or something like that, then you can do that very quickly and it doesn't take up a lot of table time and the players that aren't interested in your accounting don't have to deal with it. It's one of those sometimes like I've, I've been in sessions that become very frustrating because it feels like there's six different sessions but they're all accounting sessions they're just trying we're just trying to like get all our numbers on our sheets like kind of like in the right place to like have the fun next time and it's like well i mean i enjoyed hanging out with you guys but there was no movement there no narrative movement and it's like an episode of TV where the characters in the exact same position at the end of the show as they were at the beginning. Yeah, or a filler, right? Like yeah, a filler, filler show. show. You're just like, oh, this is a clip episode. Fuck. Like, <laughs> so, mm. so, um, so, so let, let, let's go back to, to, to the start again, right? So, uh -huh. so you, you have a real life coming together of narratives mm -hmm. multiple times. So, was this a group with, with the same individuals or did you have like a rotating? Uh, yeah, it was generally the same. There was a, there was a core. There was like three or four of us that stayed consistent, and then like one or two people would rotate in and out, like as as stuff 
people joined and stopped coming or whatever like that. But uh, yeah, there were, there were, yeah, three or four of us that, that stayed pretty consistently uh, yeah. week after week. Yeah. Um, and, and there was, there was a sense of acceptance, uh, social acceptance there. Um, so, so how did yeah. that manifest? It was bigger than that. It was more like a sense of we could, we, it gave us space to try out stuff that we couldn't, ideas that we couldn't ordinarily float in school or in friend groups or stuff like that. Like playing with, with um, like adult themes and adult storylines and stuff like that, where like, oh, we want to get we, marrying the princess. Okay, well, what happens after marrying the princess, right? Like, what if the princess doesn't want to stay married? <laughs> like there was a, there was something that happened like in our in one of our early games like that where, um, uh, and then that princess became the focus of the story for one player, and he ended up playing that princess for a good chunk of it, like totally forgetting his main character for a while. It was really interesting, and so like that that's another thing that I'm I'm interested in supporting because there was such a there were there were there was enough play space that we, we, we weren't constraining each other. There was a lot of like, Oh, you want to do this? Cool. Let's figure out how. And they're like, like for that, for that game, we were the, the, the game master was using GURPS. I don't know. So GURPS is uh, the generic universal role-playing system. And what that is, is um, a generic game that allows you to eh, basically create characters from scratch in a sort of dramatic um with dramatic flaws and advantages and stuff like that and they have a skill list and um it it's sort of bare bones but you can create just about anything if you go through character creation like a you know cyber samurai or like a wizard or you know take your pick it's 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 pretty good at that it was a complicated system i didn't understand it at the beginning uh but uh playing it was fairly easy that was the upside. So um, the, the main thing about it was that we didn't confine ourselves just to what was in the rule book. Like if, we, you know, if, if we as players wanted something, then the GM would try and make that happen to the best of their ability. And that was the kind of, like, I want to be able to scaffold that kind of gameplay. Mm -hmm. that's, so that's so you, you're saying that the, the game allowed you to do something that wasn't possible for you in any other way. So, so do, do, you, do you think you wouldn't have found a different way of trying that when the game wasn't there? I think my natural curiosity would have found some sort of expression anyway, um, or it just would have been really frustrated and acted out in some, you know, acted out in some way uh but i found the outlet super useful, like mm -hmm. super and, useful. And, and then i i imagine that the value that you see in a role-playing game is, is is that it's giving the scaffolding for the interaction mm -hmm. um so so in in some yeah like i i imagine that in, in some sense take, takes away the responsibility for you to take care of it on your own and, and and maybe that's the enabling factor yeah for i think for for kids who are socially awkward the the knowing knowing the rules of interaction is super useful because you're not one it creates a space that uh where most ideas are okay to float and that's that gives you a certain sense of security and then it also gives you, um, sorry, I just, I just heard some noise. Uh, sorry, ask the question again. Security? Yeah, there's security. And then, um, nope, lost it. <laughs> okay. So, so there, there, there's a sense of security in, mm -hmm. in, in the familiar aspect of, uh, Oh, the rules, right. Uh, it removes, it removes the potential, um, the potential misstep, right? Because you know how to go from, well, we're going to do this. And if this goes well, then we do this. If this goes badly, we do this, right? So 
in your mind is like, well, you know the, the two possibilities already and you're comfortable with either one. Right, you're living in a closed world. Right, exactly. Okay. Right. It, it, it chops off a ton of the possibilities that you would otherwise be confused by or something like this. And so um, because it, those, those, those interactions are bracketed inside that space, you don't have, and, and because, and because the space is already friendly, right? You're, these are already your friends. This is, you, you're kind of already have each other's backs. There's not, and it's non-competitive. That's the other thing. It's different from a sports uh, experience or another board game because it's inherently cooperative. And so you're all like, none of you can win this thing. And so it's, it's the, it's the challenge of imagining something together and allowing yourselves to share that and be influenced by it at the same time. And so there's an, there, the, the exchange is uh, of ideas and energy is so, um, it's so easily facilitated in that space. And, and, you know, there are practices I've done where, where um, that kind of facilitation is more direct, like, uh, like in circling practice or in um, other therapeutic practices. But, you know, the, the segment of the population that voluntarily engages with those practices is low. And the segment of the popul population that voluntarily engages with games is very high. And so, you know, or, and RPGs are like perfectly positioned to have this sort of encouraging community built in from the beginning. It's not always the case. You hear horror stories of, you know, <laughs> fucking assholes on power trips. But to the extent that, uh, to the extent that it allows people the uh the the it, it, it enables the experience to meet people where they need to be met at, in that in that so because it can be quite scary to go into a group of people uh and oh, with 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 the title of oh we're gonna have an intimacy experience or something like that right <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so you just go what what does that mean uh but it's like hey we're gonna play a game together is that oh, to you? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, like it, 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 it is interesting. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, was, was the social interaction, was it actually cooperative or was it just a bunch of individuals within the same arena? Ah, good question. Uh, it was cooperative. That was the thing. So we were, because the, um, because I noticed the story was unfolding uh, in such a way that each of us was having an influence, right? It wasn't just my story, my story, my story, my story. It was our story right from the beginning. And, and in those early games, we didn't, you didn't split the party up. Basically, it was too hard to handle the narrative if, if people went off in their own directions. Uh, the games generally aren't set up to track that at all. It becomes quite challenging to, to jump from one, one, uh, Encounter. One thing to another. So, so, yeah. So, you you're not as kid. Um, like, did 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 you have that social interaction outside of the game, or was that unique to the game? No, I did not have much social interaction outside the game. It was there were a number of factors that made much of my childhood quite isolated. And so when I had that, that bracketed group interaction, it was uh, quite impactful, you know, because there wasn't, there wasn't a chance for me to do that. Um, yeah, ordinarily. It, it, you know, it's the other thing. It's like you don't have, because I lived in a different neighborhood from my school. Now, essentially, that's what it was. We lived about half an hour away from everybody that was, that was my age and, and my friend group. And so I had some, there were some neighbor kids where I lived, but that was a different, you know, I saw they were, they were, I, I had weekend friends and I had weekday friends essentially. And um, the weekend friends didn't share any experiences with weekday friends at all. So it was like, it, I had, I had, I was in two disparate 
circles from the beginning. And so like having, being able to interact with my school friends in a place that wasn't school was really good, you know? Um, forget the question. Well, let, let, let's, let's move forward. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, like, like what happens next? Like there's this kid. Oh, uh, what happens next? Well, uh, what happens next is I, <laughs> I designed the first gaming experience that I, I ran for friends about two years after that. So I was 10 and I basically took, let me see, oh, were we in junior high at that point? No, maybe it was before that. Anyway, it was, it was, I basically took, the, I used Fantasy Star 2 as the world and converted all like the, the, what I could detect from the mechanics into dice rolls essentially. And, uh, ran my friends through that and allowed just, just, that was my first GMing experience too. So I, I didn't pick a, I didn't know how to pick a game off the shelf. I didn't know where to buy them. Like my friend had a GURPS book and his sister had played D and D and that's how he knew about it. But, um, these things were not for sale in 1990. So there was like any, like you, you had to go to a specialty bookstore or you had to like go in, uh, to a bookstore big enough to have a section that had D and D stuff in it. And there wasn't really one anywhere within walking distance, uh, or even driving distance of me at that time. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I, the only thing I could think to do was create my own thing. And so that's what I did. So that was, that was fun. It didn't go very far um, because like I didn't have the space to, to have, to run it regularly. Right. I was going over to a friend's house. And so, you know, when you were at that person's house, that person ran the game. That was just sort of like, that was a weird gentleman's agreement that existed. <laughs> I'm not sure how, why that happened, but it just naturally became the case. Um, after that, um, grade school. So after that, like, I think we stopped playing like in fifth or sixth grade. So a third, a third to fifth grade was like one thing. Um, so that was like two years of, of, you know, many after school weeks, I would say probably like 20, 20 plus sessions. So 40, 40 or so sessions, I guess, all together or something like that. Um, uh, and after that, I got into a different group, like junior high wasn't really doing it. Uh, it was sort of uh, hormones that started to kick in. And so there was just like your biology just had, just forces you to have other interests at that point. Um, and then, and it was also just tumultuous family death and, and a whole bunch of other shit. Um, and so uh, we moved also. So it was a whole big thing. Um, and then in high school, I got back into it, uh, basically playing GURPS again um, and running it for my a cluster of friends every day after school, like, like every day. So I'd run it from three to five, you know, four days out of the week. So, so how did you get back into it? Like, like what way did you move um, on? I just found, I found another cluster of people that were into it. High school was a bigger pool of people. Uh, so there were a couple of us that were slightly older. Um, so we had, you know, there, it was just, there were more, there were more nerds. So like this <laughs> is you, you so, found so the, the nerds were there and you joined them or did you take initiative? Yeah, there were, there were a cluster of nerds there that hung out with the science in the science and biology, like department area, like during lunch. And that was like, and what, you know, so it's so a couple of my friends from grade school were already in there. We're already hanging out like so it made it pretty easy like people i know and so we all had sort of similar interests and computer games were starting to be a thing the internet was starting to be a thing so this is like 95 96 so game companies were just starting to have websites um 
you still had to order, you still had to order books by catalog. So a game company wouldn't have a listing of their books online or an online store or anything like that. You would just send them an email and they would mail you a catalog. <laughs> like a paper fold out catalog. Like I still have some, like they're pretty cute. Uh, and um, so we played, that was, that was the big, so that because, because we were playing every day after school, I was running like 10 to 12 hours of games a week um, for, let's see, I would say end of freshman year, sophomore, junior. Yeah, I was, yeah, something like that. I we weren't really doing it senior year. Somebody else took over senior year, but like that was, yeah. So like three years, like 12 hours a week, roughly. Um, that's, and that's where I honed all of the, I guess the storytelling stuff that I needed because there was, I had like nothing to work with. So like most of the time, like the game, it was GURPS, right? So it was a dimension hopping game as well. So anything that I had watched in media, like recently or read about or anything, it would just be included automatically. Like it would just show up. And <laughs> so, so it was just carte blanche to introduce and slam together all kinds of weird shit. So it was fun. It was a crazy like it was Douglas Adamsy. That's what it was like. It was like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but with but with guns and cyber swords and all kinds of fun stuff. So, so so do you, do you think your orientation was different? Was was this more exploratory in in the sense of excluding including the the media that you were consuming, or uh, it was, was more exp- it was more exploratory in the sense that. I had to learn how to lay track as fast as the players were going down it. Like that was the thing that I was doing. It was just like, Oh, we do this, we do this. I'm like, okay, uh, well, this interesting thing happens. And then this thing, and then, you know, because you did this, this happened. It, it was just keeping track of it in my head. Like at one point they crashed the moon into the earth. That was a story point. Like we, we killed the pilot of the moon. The moon had a pilot. We killed that guy, crashed the moon into the earth. And, and that started the holy war because some prophecy and it was just bananas. Like it was, I don't, I don't think I could tell the story of that campaign coherently at all. It was so all over the place. Uh, I, I don't remember how that even resolved. I know they became leaders of these two, these factions <laughs> at some point. Uh, then they got sucked into some other realm when somebody else took over the game for a while. Cause I got, I got other shit I had to do or it wasn't other shit I had to do. My, my, my schoolwork was failing so badly uh, that I really wasn't allowed to see my friends during the senior year. <laughs> oh man. It was pretty rough. Um, so, so. And I sounds like escapism. Yeah. Sorry. That sounds like escapism or at least. Oh yeah, parents' perspective. Yeah, I know. Hundred percent was escapism. Yeah, no, high school was terrible. It was a terrible. I mean, apart from meeting meeting the woman who eventually I, I eventually married uh, years later, um, it was rough. It was just not fun. So I yeah, I disassociated into a fantasy world pretty consistently just to just to not deal with the pain of my actual life, mm-hmm. and that con- continued for a while. That's one of the things that really bothers me about um modern gaming culture is that so much of it is dissociative um so so when i was gaming i i had this thing that the classroom was all about what was going to happen in the game uh was that a thing that also was true for you what do you mean well that, that that all the talks in the classroom with my friends were anticipatory about, about what was going to happen later in the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like it would just be either we would actually start, we would play the game at lunch and then pick it up afterwards or like talk about like, oh, we do this, we do this, this, this. Yeah, it would be a significant portion of our non-gaming time was spent thinking about it, I would say, yeah. Um, or at least for me, right? I can't speak for the others, but yeah, at least a couple other people had it, the similar 
dents and proclivities. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it was just me. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I know it wasn't me, just me because I talked to other people and they <laughs> they talked to me. So yeah, but yeah, but yeah like there, there there's some so, some scary aspect where it can just take over, right? Like it's it's just you at that point, right? Like that's what you do. Yeah, and, uh, and then you you swap campaigns, like or you swap games effectively, but like you're still in the same holding pattern <laughs> where. And then, yeah, school school's giving in. So, so did, did did actually stopping uh, the, in, the the prohibition of your parents was that actually fruitful in in your school performances or? No, no, no. So, so how how did how did you deviate uh, or deviate um, re relocate your the time expenditure at that point? Like, like how did you fill up the gap? Masturbation. <laughs> Two hours. <laughs> oh yeah. Of one kind or another, either playing video games or actually jerking off. Like what you know, just really just filling the time with myself mm -hmm. one way or another. Like no with no fruitful. I mean, I don't like to think of any time as wasted, right? That like all of that stuff pointed me in a direction that I'm eventually going. But you know, from the perspective of would I have rather spent my time doing something else from this point? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that's okay. You know, there's not, there's not a, there's like making peace with that part of my, myself has been a fucking pain in the ass, but it's, it's what it so, is. So the computer games that you were playing, were those also role-playing games or did you have a different? Uh, yeah, I guess some of them, like, um, Diablo 2 was a big one, you know, that was one of the ones that was, that was really a time killer. Uh, later, some of the MMOs, I never really got into Warcraft, um, but some of the other ones like City of Heroes was pretty good. Uh, but yeah, uh, that one was better because the, the, once they, once the games became a little more social, they were, they're at, you actually felt like you were doing something positive because you were having interaction with other live people and it wasn't just, you know, dumping your time into the void. Um, and so, so how does that feeling manifest uh, when you're talking to other people online? Yeah. Like, uh, like how, how do you decide what's positive and what's dumping into the void? <laughs> well, if you feel good at the end of it and you're like, I, I got something, I, I have a deeper relationship with that person, even if it's just about this one subject, this one game, like this person and I are closer together now because we, we, we went through a challenging experience or we had fun or we laughed together. Now we have like this in joke, the shared vocabulary. And that's, that's where it becomes worthwhile. I think. Were you actively seeking that out or was it just no. something that was happening? No, I was not. I didn't know to actively seek it out. It just sort of happened. I didn't know you could push for that. Like I had, you know, there <clears throat> part of, part of the, the, lack of socialization is uh for me is not not being assertive and asking for things so i'm not i don't you know i i had to like learn more step by step like yeah, what internal feeling i have and then not rejecting it and then voicing it for someone else to you know accept or something like that. but i would self-reject a lot you know and just uh minimize my own experience or my own feelings when when something came up, so yeah. so the question I have there is: Do or and did you know what to ask for, or or did you just not even get there? No, didn't even get there. It wasn't. It was like because I would go, I would go on the forums occasionally and just not engage. You know, it would just be like, well, this person's opinion is dumb, and then that was it. Like I don't, I'm not, I'm not engaging beyond that. I have no. I generally like if I find somebody on the internet and I don't like their opinion, I generally just tune it out. I'm not, I don't, I don't find it's fruitful to engage most of the time. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, that they, it did, I didn't find community there that was very strong. I had good experiences, but not a, a strong community. Um, the, my, the regular people I played with were basically my brother and uh, a couple other friends, but there wasn't, we didn't branch out. Um, you know, I, I know of people that uh, met their spouses through that game. Like there were, there were a couple of in-game weddings because, you know, that's, that's how they met and like fell in love and then met in real life and got married and all, you know? So um, I never got that level of engagement from that. So yeah. When, when I think about my experience with Fora, it's, I, I, I really had a hard time dealing with them, like unless there was a reason for me to be there, right? Because there was an organization or something, right? Mm -hmm. But like, I, I never went voluntarily there because I guess the yeah, I, there wasn't something for me there to find. Like, like is is that a sense that you had as well? Yeah. Well, it's not that I went there. It's not that I went there and didn't, and didn't have the sense. It was like I would skim it and then not. Yeah, exactly. There was just there's nothing. I don't think I'm going to get anything back. So there's no reason to put anything forward. You know. Um, yeah, I would say that's the case. Yeah, it's just I don't think there's anything here for me. So <laughs> why spend the energy, right? Uh, did you did you change in that sense? Like, do, do you think have I changed no? from then till now? Yes. Yeah, now I'm much more willing to throw the energy at something, even if I don't think it's going to work with uh with engagement uh other people yeah because more often than not i find that i <clears throat> the the mode of my engagement is less about me achieving something or getting something out of it and more about forming a connection with the other person and learning something about who who they are or how they experience their internal world in ways that i don't and that's that's fascinating to me just on on the surface so now i go into social interactions with a different framing and so that's been that's been good but some of that's come from from rpgs and just just noticing what what works and what doesn't so so we're leaving high school uh <laughs> i think um so big change change yeah well actually no it was uh there was a it was a brutal holding pattern for a while after high school there was a lot of wheel spinning well not wheel spinning there I, I had no idea what i wanted to do there was didn't seem like there was any avenue viable for me to go down uh and have both a enjoyable life and productive life I could be productive and I wouldn't enjoy it, or I could have an enjoyable life and not be productive. That's, that's those look like my two options. And so I was quite depressed and quite, uh, uh, quite dissociative from my normal life, my, my, my day-to-day -day life in most of my twenties, uh, you know, or certainly my early twenties for sure. Um, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of gaming in there, like a ton and um computer gaming or no role-playing games so i got back i found i refound uh i got another friend group in in sort of the community college and uh, university after that and <clears throat> had had good experiences made good friends um but it was a lot of it was a lot of just trying not to deal with my day-to-day -day, you know trying to check out with my day-to-day -day. um and that 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 continued for a while. We played a lot of different games. Uh, you know, we were we were fairly. There were two. There was me and another guy that would volunteer to GM. So having two GMs in a group, and sometimes a third and fourth. So occasional uh, people would, uh, in the group would occasionally run something. But there were two of us that were enjoyed it quite a bit, and so we would trade off. And so when one guy got burned out, what would happen is either the campaign would get handed off, or we start a new game. And we avoided by handing off the role backwards and back and forth for years, we avoided the normal group burnout that typically happens when 
a GM feels like it's all their responsibility to keep it going, you know? Um, and so because of that, uh, we had games that lasted, you know, like years, years, like one, one campaign of D and D we took from, I joined it at when the, they were at first level. And so I joined during like the third, third session and they just hit third level. So, um, and we played that all until all the way till 21st. So we actually took a game of third edition D and D from first to 21st level. And, uh, it was, it was a massively epic campaign. It was, you know, huge, like, uh, world spanning, all the, all the good shit that you hear about the D&D. Um, and after, after that, what we do, we, we did a bunch of other stuff. We just played different games. We ran a game of Riddle of Steel for a long time. Um, Let's see. Vampire Dark Ages, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, so, so what's the purpose of, of swapping games? Like, good question. Were you, guys, were you guys looking for something or was it just like, oh, we need, we need to switch it up? Or? Uh, yeah, mostly it was a let's explore different, different things. Uh, you know, knowing that the game we're playing is going to facilitate a particular experience. Let's try a game that purports to facilitate another one. Like here, we're going to play Call of Cthulhu. And the point of this game is we're not heroes. In fact, we're probably not going to survive the adventure. Like somebody's going to go insane or die before the end. And that's what we're here for. We're here to like <clears throat> kind of put these characters through the meat grinder and enjoy enjoy like their their inevitable destruction at the hands of the story and it's like well that's sounds fun you know if you have that kind of particular that that like you know that that group uh number of us were really into like uh lovecraftian horror movies and stuff like that so like in the mouth of madness with one like john carpenter's in the mouth of madness and um uh event horizon and uh i really like the hellraiser movies and so there was a, a whole bunch of fodder that we had in common uh, in terms of liking psychological horror and uh, cosmic horror and all that kind of stuff. So um, that felt like that just sort of naturally happened in the early 2000s. Yeah. So we started branching out and doing different stuff, uh, not just not just D and D all the time. Or GURPS, that was the other game, but. Like that group didn't like GURPS at all. So we didn't do that one <laughs> for the most part. So uh, I'm thinking of this psychological profile and, and what it says about you. Like, uh, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> well, well, like there's, there's this, this, this liking of this existential horror, right? So that speaks to, to somewhere inside of you. So oh, yeah. you were working through that. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's true. Yeah, I, I, it, I, I, even recently, something I noticed, like even last week, I was talking to my wife and, and said, like, you know what? I think I act, act, I actively seek out being in pain sometimes, just because I know I'm going to grow from it. And I, you know, it was one of those moments where I was like, shit, I, that lines up to so many points in my life where I was just throwing myself into a meat grinder for I don't know what reason. You know, and then afterwards, like, I'd be, I would feel good about the experience, but I, I didn't know why or how those things related. It just felt like I was just torturing myself for some reason or another. Um, so yeah, existential dread that's in there. <laughs> right in the way. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, like you're, you're in the holding pattern. Uh, it's applying mm -hmm. a holding pattern. Uh, it's doing therapy. Uh, implicitly <laughs> yeah yeah i guess so a little bit like it was self, it was self-therapeutic right because i was it was basically group sessions where we could unpack our bullshit every week um and talk about whatever was fucking with us i mean not in super open terms that was the kind of thing that group never really achieved like a level of coherent uh connection that 
that I found with 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 friends in other spaces later. So I felt there was like a certain depth of connection because of the amount of time and the amount of uh, how well I feel I understand how they think and where what kind of stories they like and, and how they how they feel about themselves and what kind of proclivities they have. And then on another level, like it's still difficult to have open conversations there about life challenges, for example, or things of this nature, or like, like even um, just what's going on. There just wasn't a lot of like back and forth sharing of inner worlds. Mm -hmm. And do, that's do, do you think you are ready for that? That's the thing. I don't think we were, see, but like there wasn't any way to become ready for it or learn how to do it. That was the thing. I think there was a, there was a desire there mm -hmm. for all of us. That's what I feel we were looking for in some sense, you know, showing up at week after week. But because um, it wasn't just the story, because the story would stop and start and the games weren't the same. There was, there was no other consistency, but we liked each other, you know, mm -hmm. and so there was. Um, so I feel there was a reach towards that, but I feel the reach was frustrated because there wasn't, there wasn't, <laughs> the game wouldn't show us how, essentially. The game did not contain that kind of scaffolding. It contained a different kind. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that I think a game can do both, I think games can do both. And I think it's worthwhile for a game to attempt to do both. I'm not sure a game has ever really tried to do both explicitly, but I'm not really trying to do both explicitly. I'm just trying to put tools in front of people. Because um, I, I think that's all you really can do. And then uh, what happens after that is not, not on me, but I, I feel like there's just been, there's just, they're just, they're just a lot of clunky tools, you know, for so this. I, I just imagine this group of, of nerds uh -huh. sitting there, um, all projecting the, the psychological problems onto the game. Like, like is that? <laughs> That's true. Well, at, so, <laughs> so, so these these nerds, like, were they aware of that that was happening? That there was this projection. Like, I'm like, was that a so thing that? That you could actually see or, or was it just happening and, and nobody saw the elephant that's an interesting question i feel maybe some of us were kind of conscious of it and i think i think some of us were kind of conscious of other people doing it but not conscious of us doing it mm -hmm. you know like there were times when I would be like, yeah, that guy keeps doing this thing like over and over again. And it's like, ah, he's probably like this, right? He probably has like had this experience or whatever. Like it. And I would not, and not self-apply or not self-reflect and not know to like take the projection and then just turn it back on myself and see what I see. Um, <clears throat> so that wasn't, that wasn't present as a, as a tool. And I didn't know to do that. So like, uh, noticing that I was projecting stuff onto the game. It's actually so it, 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 with me to go back and think about it. It, it, <laughs> it looks like me that there's this whole layer of, of reality there mm -hmm. uh, and the layer of reality sometimes then like pops into awareness like like in a needle prick, right? Like <laughs> through the screen, mm -hmm. <laughs> it retreats again. And, and I, I I just I just see these these guys like well may, maybe even like like drunk and stoned, right? And, and they're just riding these waves and they don't, they have no idea oh, about what's actually going on. We didn't we didn't use any substances. So we weren't yeah. none of we were we didn't drink. We didn't do none of us did any drugs. Um, it was, oh, it was looking back on it, like for D and D players it was actually particularly weird. My experience. Yeah, that, so, so, yeah. so was, was it tried? Like, was, was it like, like, did you have an, a night where you did drink, for example? Nope. No, like never. Never. 
like was that a unwritten agreement like like what was you just didn't do it and, and were these individuals also not drinking outside of the uh maybe half maybe maybe a couple of them yeah half of them were but like not yeah during the game no just wasn't a thing i mean we would later yes during those years no interestingly so so yeah so so with with the later as as a comparison like like what do you think the drinking and the and the smoking and stuff like how, how does how does that affect uh, the experience um I don't know for uh, because like we would show we would show up to the the early games where there was there was no drinking there was very little actual socialization there was like the game was the focus there there was socialization by proxy but the game was the focus and then later uh the socialization became a bigger focus and the game became one of the reasons to get together and it was not not the sole focus so so i've been going to yoga lately and like mm -hmm. there's this this really awkward atmosphere which which i'm really uncomfortable about for some reason but it's like people don't really talk to each other right like <laughs> like there's no relationships and, and i'm yeah, did did you have that as well? Like the fact that there was, you just came there and it was like, all, all well, when are we going to start? Right, like that type of conversation. Yeah, that happened sometimes. Yeah, it was like you know we were just waiting for people to show up and then we would just go. So basically, uh, until everybody was there, it was like socialization time. When the last person got there, maybe we do five, ten more minutes of talking, and then it was like straight in. Um, because we were all there to to un to get through it in a sense, like we were there to, you know, have have the experience we were we were all showing up for, which was to have like, you know, to 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 smack our characters into the world and use our the things that we had collected over the sessions and in creative ways and, and unpack the story that way. But there, you know, only. Only later was socialization like like sort of encroaching. So I would say that, that happened more in my 30s when there was a so I sort of returned to gaming with it with a with a half the same crew and then like half new people. And then the new people were much more in the we are gathering to socialize with the game being uh, slightly secondary, I would say. And that's where that's where it was more social. Like we would get together, we would order, order dinner first, um, you know, before in like earlier, it would be like we would get fast food and then eat it before the game and then not be eating as, you know, or we'd eat separately or bring you know, whatever, like one guy would have a sandwich and nobody else be eating whatever it was. And then in my thirties, it was like, we get together, we eat, we, we, you know, we have beer or whatever like that and um, relax because we all had, more stressful jobs, right? So, like, there was a, a, a the 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 focus of the the activity shifted from one where we were showing up to uh, move through a story to one where we were we were using it as an excuse, not an excuse, but half of us were using an excuse to socialize, and then the other half were interested in the game. And actually, that same sometimes caused problems when. Like we'd be, we'd be there for an hour and like, you know, at least two people were kind of starting to get visibly antsy. Uh, and, you know, fair enough, right? Like they're showing up to do something and they're not where, you know, nobody else is doing the thing. And they're like wondering why they're spending their time doing the thing they're not, they don't want to do. So what was that change? Something that was facilitated by the new people or was that, you entering a new phase in your life? Both. Yeah, both for sure. So uh, the, 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 I would say that people sort of uh, uh, catalyzed that change, but also like that was a part point in my life where my life had become 
relatively stable day to day. You know, I was just working, coming home, watching TV, working. There was no, I wasn't going to school. I wasn't uh, uh, making art. I wasn't, you know, writing anything. And it, it, that was, it was in that time that I started like taking game design more seriously as I was, um, we had played a bunch of games and I was like, you know what? I, there's some games that don't really do anything that I would want to do. I'm trying to use, hack all these things together. It's not quite working maybe I should just like really seriously figure out like what pieces will work together and, and, and build something. Yeah. And I did that. Um, like most of my stuff at that phase were like mashups where they would, I would take one part from one game and then carve out a bunch of it and take parts from another game and just hack them together and, and write like a Google doc. And here's like, here's how we do this. And you know, I had some pretty good sessions like that, pretty good, some successful games where it was just, uh, um, you know, those kinds of things or conversions or um, stuff like that. And then I started writing um, what would become the, the, the main game I'm working on now. And that started out as I want to do, I want to do D&D, but easier and everybody has their own adventuring party. That was that's the main thing and and you could and the idea would being like big fights would be like a, a warhammer fantasy battle type event where you would have like a captain who's your main dude and then like a squad of guys and then every every player has that same thing and you have you're fighting like a small army that's that sounded cool to me so that's where i started with that idea and then uh i wrote well, 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 let, let's hold on here for a second All right so so you 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 now so, so you started as a player, you upgraded to DM, and, and now you're in, in the designer seat. So, so how does the designer seat change your experience of playing? Good question. Uh, <laughs> putting putting on designer goggles makes games frustrating. Because you, you, you know, it, it, the thing that jumps out to you the most is not how much fun you're having, but how much fun you're not having, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and you go like, well, why, you know, <laughs> I just did these three things in a row and I could have skipped all of those things and gotten to the exact same point. And why did, the, why did the game have me do this? And it's just because, you know, the designer wanted to show how clever they were or, you know, there's, there's something like that and it's like that's fine uh but you, you know you made me go through the steps and i don't want to go through the steps so i started you know hacking stuff apart and being like well this, this game works fine except for this part it doesn't work all that great so let's just do something about this part and you know use the rest of it and i i was rewriting all the games we were playing basically like uh world of darkness had some stuff in it that i didn't really like um, the magic system in Riddle of Steel was uh, imminently exploitable in certain ways uh, and not really fantasy feeling. Um, there were, what else was I working on? So, so, yeah, all kinds of stuff at that point. So, were you starting to be intentional about how you were playing from the designer perspective, right? Like, so it was like, oh, like I, I want to do this specific game in, in, in this configuration because I want to test stuff. Yeah, I would do I would do that with running games. Yes. I would like, let's see if this works. Let's see if this works. You know, how do we do how do we make it so that um, the group itself has character, you know? So not not just the individuals coming together with with their own individual characters, but once the once the group is coherent, does the group have its own character, and does the that the character of that that community advance? Right. That's that's interesting. That's an interesting question to me. Um, I, I did that with a mage in World of Darkness. So like as as they started uh, getting more into the the politics, then I we sort of changed speeds a little bit, and their their um, I can't remember what they call it in the mage. But anyway, their, their cluster of people had its own like bylaws and the things they cared about in the city and what they what they were supposed to be responsible for. And you know, the 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 abilities of their 
sanctum and the resources they could marshal as a group were different than the resources they could marshal together. And that was, that was interesting to me. And then Blades in the Dark came out and sort of did that with the crew. So as, as players, you choose a playbook, which has your archetype on it. And then as a collective, you choose a, a character sheet basically for your group as well. And that would be selected from something like, uh, this is a game where you're playing scoundrels in a vaguely fantasy city. And so like assassins would be one kind of crew or thieves, shadows, I think they call them, would be another kind of crew and smugglers would be another kind of crew. Um, so uh, doing that gives you different abilities and lets you earn experience for doing different things. And so the idea that you're going to have, you could play this game a couple of times and actually have different with different crews and even playing the same playbook, you're going to have a totally different experience of the game because the crew character sheet matters as much as your individual sheet. And so that's interesting to me too. Like the idea of communities gaining their own attributes independent from the individuals that make them up, which happens, right? So. Yeah. So, so where are we at in your life now? Is this, this is, I'm in my thirties. I'm working, uh, working at the family business where I'm, where I'm still working right now. Um, and not having a good time at life, generally speaking, just going, moving through it day to day and having enjoyable experiences, but I am not fulfilled for the most part. Uh, it's, I wasn't, I wasn't ex getting to express myself creatively or, or feel like that, uh, the expressions I would be making would be valid if they were expressed. Oh, that, that, that's fascinating. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, can you unpack that? Yeah, sure. So I mean, it was just the idea that like, that, like writing an RPG was not something that you could do that I thought I could do as a career move like writing games. And now it's like, you can, you can, there's so many avenues to make money doing it. If I had just started putting stuff out when I started writing, like I'd have, you know, a 12 year catalog at this point, but I realized that I don't, I'm not really interested in making products. That's, that doesn't fascinate me at all. Um, like I, I don't know. There's something, there's some, I, I don't, I don't know if it's just sour grapes in that regard, where it's like, well, I haven't, I haven't published a game where like have like a hard copy of a book I've written or anything like that. So I don't really want it, but at the same time, like, I just don't feel anything I've, I, I've put out merits that. Yeah. You're not worthy. Yeah. An exploratory phase. Yeah, but even the stuff, see, the thing is, is like, there's so much out there that's, like, I read it and I go, why the fuck is this person charging for this? Like, this is a sketch. This is like, this is, you know, you're asking 15 bucks for this PDF and it's 10 pages. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I appreciate there's some work went into this, but this is not, I don't, I don't. I don't feel like I'm going to get value out of this. And I don't believe like more than a, one, a month of days went into this. And I, it's probably more like 10 hours. Um, and the games are, it's like a scattershot of indie games where, where you can have a meaningful experience with some of these games because they're very highly bracketed. They're like, here's the exact scenario you're in. Like, yeah, here's, here's one. Uh, you play a 16 year old Polish kid during World War II entering the war and by the end of it, you die. Like, and then it's just a, like the game just does damage to you and eventually it sucks. Like that's, that's the whole game. And it's really just to ha have that sort of experience of like figuring out what you'll sacrifice for what uh, during the course of the story. Um, and that can lend to a very meaningful experience for, for that one and a half hours for somebody because uh, it, it can drop you in to that space quite quickly. My issue with, with something like that is that it doesn't lend itself to the long game 
they can't do a campaign or something like that, where you can show up and have this communal uh, narrative told over like, you know, the course of a year, let's say. There's no games that I know of that try to do that bracketed meaningful experience in a way where the players are also partially in charge of creating the brackets where, you know, like, okay, you want to play, here's a game that's the 16 year old kid in world war two. Well, what if you want to play the 30 year old who's already been to war and is in another war? And it's just like, I don't, it's a different narrative, right? Like this is a person who's weary. They're not scared. They're they're. It's a different, thing and so like the idea that you can create your own brackets and then use that to have the meaningful experience is something that i'm trying to figure out how to outline Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah and and i heard an aspect of you're you're also trying to mind find meaning for yourself as well Uh as create the meaningful experience so like i I assume that's where you where you started to get into the corner of the internet as well right so yeah as so as the game i so the game started out as uh called war mage it's very generic i just needed a generic title for it so and you were just a a, a wizard that had a squad of guys you were with and as the game developed like first of all i wanted like a more interesting setting for everything And so I started looking into real world history and mythology because there's always like the craziest stuff in history is stuff that you would not, you would disbelieve if you read in fiction, right? That all, that's always the case. Like like that one, um, the, I'm blanking on his name, but there was a Chinese, the story of the Chinese general that he knew the, the enemy army was encroaching. And so he just went outside the gates and sat in front of them playing a lute and he was known to be a wicked strategist and so when the enemy scouts approached they relayed messages back to their commander saying the general's just outside the city with the gates open playing a lute and all it sent the rest of the the enemy generals into a total panic because they were like okay he's got like i don't know we can't find anything that he's got We, we know he's got something up his sleeve he can't just be sitting there waiting for us to take the city that can't be the case, right? He's going to fuck us up. So, so, and they left, but that was exactly the case. He had just, it was a total bluff, total bluff. And like, there's an, there's a, and there's a saying, there's an idiom in Chinese that comes from that story. It's like, this is a general something's castle. And it means like, we got to the party and the party sucks. <laughs> Basically it's like, this is an empty, this is an empty party. Um, and, and so, those kind of moments uh i I paid attention to those in history and then where the fulcrums of history were like where where uh the generals prophets queens uh, uh, even even normal people that just did something really strange and changed the course of history that became sort of the focus and like what would it be like to sort of be that know that you were going to be that person like if if at the start of the game the game, like, here, here's something about the game, games that don't, that generally they don't say. Um, by virtue of the fact that you're the only people in the game world that actually have autonomy as players, you're by default special and separate from everything else, right? So the idea that, that somehow in the narrative you're chosen by fate and to to be uh, you know w- one of these fulcrums of history is an idea that's interesting to me. Like you're you're it's not like you the game just says like a priori like you're here because you're here. The narrative is going to revolve around you, right? And you're going to have this thing. You're, you're the only moving piece. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a sense, right? Like you get to decide what that means too. Like, do you want to be the only moving piece that sits in a cave for thirty years being a hermit? And then comes out at the end of that with some some insight like that. That should be that should be something that the game could handle, in my opinion. Like, 
what would that look like if you just <laughs> all you did in the game world was just explore the inner world forever like for a bunch of years and mm -hmm. and then you come down out of the mountains with some insight and you can fix society but then your problem is like nobody will listen to you right because <laughs> you've just been up your own ass for 30 years <laughs> never had that problem yeah right <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so so you're looking for history mm -hmm. uh, and where do you end up next uh well that takes me into a very strange place um i start looking because i'm looking at history i start looking at mythology and archetypal mythology and then and, and magic i had taken anthropology of of in college of number of anthropology classes it was like my uh, i think i was like one class away from a minor i just didn't want to do the extra class forever um but i took uh anthropology of religion witchcraft and magic uh central america's uh pacific islands like um i was fascinated by uh more primitive cultures that had survived into the modern era um and their practices and and what how their beliefs were structured and, and how the beliefs were structured of people who lived in uh, the dynastic Egypt and who lived in uh, biblical times, who lived through, you know, like uh, Babylon and Samaria and all, all these, like, how, how do these people think? Why did they, you know, what would their, if let's let, the, and the idea was like, let's assume magic was real and then civilizations developed it right? Would it, what would happen? Would, it be, would we get Babylon again? Would we get Sumeria or would, would, would something else happen? And that's where the idea of, I started researching ancient magical practices, um, ancient religions, and I started finding an upsetting amount of overlap between the most modern physics, what the most modern physics were saying and what the most ancient mystical traditions were saying. And so that started me on a journey of exploring modern, the modern occult, the modern mystics, uh, people that are really trying to do this thing, um, have uh, intense connective experiences with reality, fundamentally, whatever they're calling it. Um, and so that, ha that has driven the game into this, this, this new spot where... Um, I was reaching for some framework to encompass the kind of stories I wanted to tell where the players were explicitly in charge of making their own meaning. And when I stumbled onto Verveke's uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis <laughs> lectures, I was like, oh, this guy's on the same track. Like he's, he's interested in like how civilizations go sideways, essentially. Like what, why, why do individuals in a civilization stop attending to the civilization? You know, that was interesting to me. Um, because, and then the game, the game Ashes of the Magi is about this sort of thing. It's like, what, what happened such that all these people in charge, the wise, right? Let everything go to shit. Why is society on fire if all the people at the top are supposed to be our best people? Um, and so born out of that idea, I started looking into what it would be like to have a, a game where you're waking up in the middle of the apocalypse and you don't know what's going on. But, but, but you know that you can fix something. That's, that's the idea. You're, you're specifically chosen you're, because you're in the game the narrative centers around you. And so now you have all the decisions you make affect something, right? And you know they do because when you wake up from the apocalypse, you can start seeing the threads of fate and you know you, you can inspect your own impacts. And that's something, you know, humans can do that, but it takes a minute for us to... <laughs> for us depending to on who you are. <laughs> yeah, depending on who you are. Sometimes it takes all your life. Um, Whoa, yeah. So, so, so you, you made a big shift there, right? Mm -hmm. In some sense where 
where you're in some sense letting go of of the repackaging of different aspects of, of other games and and you're, you're trying to put forward something well that is worthy right <laughs> um because because i i think i think that's the big shift that that you were making there yeah um and and then yeah i don't i don't know if we we're there yet but like you come into these people on the discord serve um they 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 come up with these ideas and they're aligned with your ideas but like yeah. they're they're pushing somewhere else so so what, what was that like that was so like i would say the the last version of ashes that i wrote where it was so I play tested a version of it where it was still very much mechanically like, you know, I'm trying to, I'm really trying hard to make an elegant system, right? Which it looks different from actually making an elegant system. <laughs> so that 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 game um, ended up being playable and fun, and I ran it for a crew for five sessions, four or five sessions, and. Um, it was basically doing everything I wanted it to do. And I was pretty happy with it. And um, it was, it was doing the things of allowing uh, it was broadly allowing them to choose their own path, but it wasn't asking them for, to provide a lot of bracketing in, in this, in the sandbox. And that was something that's always frustrated me. It's like, well, I want to kind of decide what the adventures I want to go on are. And so like, why can't I have a little more say in like what my character cares about? And then why can't the game care about what my character cares about a little more? So uh, as I started writing the GM section for that version, I, I was like, okay, so here's how I want it to go. I want players to give, so you look at the players, the stuff on the player character sheets that they've already told you and you kind of pull, pull from that and plug it in like this. And then I got obsessed with like, okay, well, how, okay. So I know how the game is going to run. It's going to run like those five sessions I just did. Um, and uh, 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 it's, it's, it's working and it's kind of doing what I want. Okay. So now I need to write the GM section and I need to write the, the uh, I want to write an opening so that the players can go through um, character creation as, as a game, right. They can kind of like, pick up the game as they're playing it by, by going through character creation as a, as a sort of gamified in a way. And so as I started working on those, in those two directions, uh, both on the GM section or what would ultimately become like the guide section and um, the opening, uh, I noticed two different things happening. One, both, both of those things were completely intertwined in ways that I didn't understand before. And uh, this was gonna be much harder than I initially expected because the ideas I were playing with were at the level of, of archetype. And in order for those ideas to be executed properly, you, it really helps to understand them at a deep level. And to understand archetypes at a deep level takes a fucking lot. And it's a pain in the ass. And uh, I've read a bunch of stuff that has radically undermined my worldview uh, in the last three or four years. Um, and I've, I've, I've also had, because, because the game is based on um, sort of encouraging the players to seek out their own mystical practice, like having done that myself and having experiences that I can't otherwise categorize as rational. I, I'm, I'm also in a spot where I'm like, well, how do I make sense of this shit now? Uh, so the game is trying to do that as well. Um, like where do you, like once you have uh, some of these experiences, how do you slot in to other things, right? Now that now that you you can you can take a non-dual perspective in in certain certain places, um, what does that mean for the rest of how you dualize reality? 
Like there are, there are questions now that arise that only have paradoxical answers. Uh, and that's informed the game design to a, a large extent. So now the, the book itself is much more like a grimoire of like, here's, here's how you get these results, right? Here's how I get, here's how I did it. Here's how I think you could try it. And then it's also strongly symbolic because that's, that's the level at which I, I think the game works best. Like when the symbols are, are coinciding and, you know, the, the hero is facing their nemesis and the thing that the him, hero and the nemesis symbolize are actually at odds. And it's not just the bad guy tying the princess to the railroad tracks, right? Like there's a, you know, when your character stands for something and then that thing is actually challenged and not with some dice rolls, but with uh, the fact that your character might not be right that's interesting to me. And so the moments where you can either break from your previous self or reinforce a, a, a belief uh, or, or a position that your character like sinks into, you know, it, it was taught it's like one of the things that really helped from the Verveke stuff was the idea of the reciprocal narrowing and the reciprocal opening, right? And so in, in, in Ashes, reciprocal narrowing like has a, when that happens, there's a mechanical impact on the rest of the game, right? So like when you have a character that uh, does something and gains despair, if they gain enough despair, that despair starts overflowing into their community and then starts overflowing into the greater world. And so um, similarly, when you have, when you start repairing that in, in your own character, you can then have the ability to repair it in other places, right? And you can expand other options and, and give yourself more options. And so like that, the, the structures there, interestingly, are already inherent in RPGs. They're just not mapped properly, generally speaking. They're, they're not mapped with that, with the knowledge that the structures are there. They're, they're trying to, they're attempting to unpack something they're not quite like equipped to unpack. Yeah, they're making it flat. Yeah, it's making it flat, right? So like you can, but the reciprocal narrowing is like your character dies at the bottom of that in most games, right? Mm -hmm. So like you lose resources, you lose resources. It's harder for you to gain resources. Oh, you lost. Oh, you died. Opening is like, reciprocal opening is gaining experience and gaining levels, right? That's how it's conceptualized in most games. Generally, it's yeah, not. And it's, it's always exponential both ways, right? Uh -huh. it's, it's really hard to balance uh, the growth because like, more options is more potential for more options and right well that's the reciprocal aspect right <laughs> <laughs> and uh so, so so in a sense it's really true like both directions but it's it's not uh good for the, the game experience right right i mean so the problem is, is like so what do you do when your character dies that's an interesting question in a game right like well how does the game handle it um for me, like I like the idea uh, of the of in ashes when your main character dies, you don't stop playing, but they're still dead. You don't resurrect them or anything like that. But the, the what they embodied continues to live on in other characters. So you can start playing other characters that are uh, that were all already knew your your mind your main character because you have a squad, right? So you have you have a a, 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 um, a community built in. And so you pick up somebody from that community where you can, you have the option to do it, or you can just play the community and you don't have to select out another individual. You can just like say like, well, I'm just gonna, you know, the community is gonna have its own thing. I'm kind of done with the individual part of the game. Like that's not interesting to me anymore. Um, and now I wanna do, you know, this, the, 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 like, and you, yeah, your community will still have a face that's necessary. You, there will be an individual that, you know, sort of represents the community in the game. But you won't. You don't necessarily have to play them as an individual character after that. It's uh, there's a uh, there, you can have you could there's there's modal shifts built into the game based on how you want to fuck with the narrative. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, I, I want to go to the level of motivation, right? Because you you you're doing this for multiple reasons, right? So, yeah. so one is. You, you want to 
actually have a role-playing game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the primary reason I have a game I actually want to play. Uh, but 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 I mean that, that there's actually role-playing instead of that you're you're acting out this structure, right? So, right. so that that's an aspect, and then you you also want to facilitate. Well, the way that you introduce it to me is psychological, but like you're, you're also calling it spiritual development, right? Yeah. So, so in a sense, you're, you're creating a sandbox where you can create grounding for your experience. Um, is that a correct description? Yeah. Um, and then the third aspect is you, you're picking up the challenge of, and this this is a really big deal, and <laughs> I hope you you make it work. Uh, but but you're picking up this challenge where where there's a responsive game engine that allows that dynamically adapts with with the story of the players, whether they're in a group. Or, or as an individual, which, which that's like a really high bar. <laughs> and when, when I when I met you, I, I was really skeptical. Um, although uh, I, I can I kind of see where how it might work. Um, yeah. So you you want to you want to take it uh, into the present, like connecting to the present, like like what 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 is uh, what is happening right now. So what's happening right now in the game? So I've been, so one of the things that was really instrumental in the development of the game that I, I want to mention was the podcast that I do uh, called Flail Forward. That is a game design podcast that uh, has been going for, well, we've been doing it for four years, I guess now. And that was, that was like, I guess my graduate program, I would say, in game design. Um, it, like, big partially due to that I actually I'm I am a certified game designer I have a certificate from the University of Washington now uh, that you know I went through their program um, to learn to do it at, at that level um, and that was due to interviewing Jonathan Tweet who wrote uh, D&D third edition one of the writers of D&D third edition and he was teaching the, the class and so that's how I found out about it and so I pursued it uh, you know uh, seriously um, and, um, that, that podcast also enabled me to talk to a lot of other designers and enabled me to bounce my ideas off, um, other amateurs, uh, two of which have had, have, have published games since, since we started the podcast. Um, and that, all that being able to talk, like really dig into people who loved dismantling the ideas I was bringing up super, super helpful. So the, like the president has gone through this meat grinder uh, of, <laughs> of critique and feedback. You know, I, I put, I put it in front of them a couple of times and they're like, yeah, no, or like this part, good, this part that doesn't make any sense, you know, and they're, they're, it's great because they, 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 the, the feedback I get is honest and directed, which is really hard to find, right? Like, you know, um, usually you'll get one or both, but not, the, not at the same time. Usually you'll get like, yeah, this is shit, but it's like nobody tells you how to fix it. Or, <laughs> you know, somebody will say like, oh, you could do this. It's like, yeah, well, that fucks up three other things I, I, I'm relying on. So you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so having, having, having experienced feedback and good, good feedback has been really instrumental. Um, where it's at present is I'm still pulling teeth on getting the opening all done, uh, getting all the concepts introduced in, in an order that makes sense to the players and gives them usable tools as soon as they get handed the tools basically. So like, as soon as you get handed a tool, there should be an opportunity to use the tool, right? Like that, that reinforces, like, this is what it's for. Um, I, the last, so I ran it for someone, the opening part for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, uh, beginning of May. 
And it went really well. The feedback was good. He said, he said it was a really good, really great experience. And um, he would be interested to do it again. Although at that point, like where I was running it, um, I was essentially doing something that you and Mark had suggested I do in one of our, our back and forth sessions, which was just um, take the script and run it through. And there, there are a couple of like particular bullet points that uh, you guys have suggested I should put earlier. They're really like, I was like, it, when it worked, it really worked. And I was like, oh, okay, great. That, that, that really helped out. Um, uh, and so, so it's just, a, it's a matter of just like tuning, tuning that at this point. Um, and then once that's done, that gives me, I, the, the, so the, the other major challenge I'm sitting in right now is how to get the guide to run the game based on how I'd run it, except that I have to be flexible enough for the way I run it to fail gracefully and for the game to catch people. So like, because my, the way I'm going to do it is not going to be the way somebody else is going to do it. Um, I, I want to make, I mean, the goals are like, it just, it only tracks the things you need to track. That's the really, that's the fuckiest part about RPGs is like the game tells you to track certain shit and then um, doesn't make those things useful at all. Right. And so it's really, it's really like asking the players to what they care about and then letting them care about those things and then only interjecting the disruptions at the appropriate points. So it doesn't feel arbitrary. So it feels like a, a, a legitimate story reaction to something they did. So yeah, like you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a pain in the ass to write, uh, but it's, it's fun. Well, no, actually I'm at the point right now where it's, I'm just, it feels like I'm punching a brick wall. Like it fucking sucks actually. Uh, well, I, I, I was searching for a specific answer. I, I, I kind of get the, <laughs> the answer to the question now because like the, the sessions that, that you did with me and Mark were like really like in, in the archetypical realm, right? Like we were like really trying to get to get the structure and we, we overhauled like multiple things. And, and yeah, like yeah. you said, you, we, we changed the ordering of things and and in, in order to, to make a progression. So um, like it's, it seems to me that you have to reshift your thinking and your conceptualization like multiple times, right? You come in from this, oh, like we're just doing a cut and paste <laughs> into, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm designing my own paste into, okay, like there's something going on and I need to capture the thing that's going on and then find a way to express it and, and hand it over to other people. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah, so I'm in, the middle, I'm in this, this weird intersection of art and writing and like design and- Prophecy. Also the UI, that's the other thing, like the user interface, right? The user interface mm -hmm. is so important. Um, and and when I when I had the insight to make this a journaling game, like make a journal like one of the biggest pieces of kit, that really opened things up because then it was like, ah, now I, I know how to now now I can get out of my own way a little bit because I can rely on the players to track the things they care about in the journal because I don't need to tell them what's on the character sheet, right? I can put the stuff on the character sheet that the game really cares about and the game's gonna use pretty much no matter what. And then I can create so much sandbox space for the players in the journal that I, it kind of takes care of a bunch of my problems all at once. Um, and so really it's it, the, the opening now is, is part of it is instructing players how to use the journal to, to, to play the game. Um, and writing that part is also a challenge because it's like, I want to make it evocative and also functional. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. When you say that, like a bunch of ideas already come to my mind. So that, that <laughs> <laughs> when you're inhabiting the same space. So, so yeah, you, you, you're hitting this brick wall because, like, in some sense, you've been leveling up, right? In, in the arena that you play. And it's like, well, yeah, you, you could, you could make something worthy in, 
the arena a level down, but like to test this other arena that's better. Let, let's just play yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's that's the driving force. It's like fuck. I can see. I can imagine. I can't even see it. I can imagine the flow of something like this. I can imagine like getting into it and the peak moments that happen. And so I'm taking the peak moments and working backwards, basically. And so it can produce the peak moments with a greater degree of consistency because D&D produces peak moments too. It's not that it doesn't. It's just that it makes it wildly inconsistent because so much of it is based on, actually so much of the peak experiences in D&D are based on which rules the game master is actively ignoring. Mm. And so that's not a lesson you even learn until you're, you hate it a little bit. <laughs> you know? it, it's like society, right? Like some law. Oh, there you go. Enforced, yeah. Like right? and, like, and, and those, those are the, the things that are not enforced is, is what distinguishes you from the other people, right? Yeah. That's. Yeah. So, so, you know, getting to a place where the, like I, I can picture the peak experiences and then like, oh, you know, we want to defeat the bad guy, but the bad guy has to mean something really shitty, right? He has to, he has to represent something really fucking awful. And so you have to give the players the opportunity to tell you what they find really awful in order for them to, to, to in order for you to grab them by their motivation. And, 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 and the, you're, the thing is, is like, the, I, I want the guide position in Ashes to mostly get out of the way and just like, Set, set a scene, let the player run through it. The player then tells you what they want to have happen, happen after that. Then you set another scene, basically. So it's, it's less about you putting down story points before the adventure for the players to hit along the way. And like, you know, there's going to be a boss fight here and there's going to be blah, blah, blah. And then the village is going to burn down. So well, why did the village burn down? Does that, do they give a shit that the village burns down? Maybe they hate that village. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe like, who knows, right? Um, so the opportunity to, I want, I want, I want the game to create the opportunity and it does this well to the extent that it works. Um, tell the, tell the game what you want out of it. You know, like you're going to answer the question that the game's going to give you a feedback loop. The feedback loop is going to be not what you expect, but it's going to, it's going to ask you questions, the answers of which you can't help but care about. Yeah, that's what it is. And so it's uh it's also like a magic trick. That's the other thing. It's like stage magician shit. It's like like this would this will work on somebody. I mean, but when they know the trick, they'll know the trick, right? So it'll be like then 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 they can suspend disbelief and sort of go through the game as like, well, I can tell the game any choices I want now and play a character that's wildly different from me and have you know, take them to their logical extreme. But the game by default sort of like assumes that you're going to be answering based on your own proclivities from, from the start. Um, well, that's and, a fair constraint, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but once and, you know... And also, right, like you want to have it in, in like a psychological therapeutic context as well, right, which would require it to, to be close to you instead of right. getting too far away because then you're just avoiding dealing with the things you have to deal with. Um, yeah, so, so you're working on this game. Um, mm -hmm. Everything's kind of leading up to this in, in some aspects, or, or maybe you, you take everything that you have and you, you combine it into, <laughs> into the game. Um, so looking forward, all right, like how, how do you see the game in five years? Do you, do you think it's recognizable from what you have now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think this is. I don't think there's a form beyond that. I, beyond where I this thing is reaching. So it's it's like in some sense, story doesn't exist above the archetypal layer, right? Once you get into like the realm of pure abstraction um there's kind of a linear narrative but like it's one plus one equals two right like that's you need archetypes 
in order to have any kind of story content. Like even if it's boy meet girl, like that's you have you have to, <laughs> you have you have the archetypes right there. You kind of like there's a story already. Um, uh, but you can't you can't get simpler than that. So like for me, like Ashes is at the point where I'm dealing with the simplest building blocks of what this could touch. And so like I, anything that comes out of this is going to, you know, my version of what comes out of dealing with these simple building blocks is going to be totally different than whoever comes after me. And it's like, oh, this guy's doing an archetypal game. Well, I can do an archetypal game too. It's going to be different. Um, but that's that doing it at that level, it, it means that I, I, I am trying to do something that is uh, not a product of its era, right? I'm trying to do something that would would be something that you could have seen in 1500s Renaissance, right? It was just like, oh, here's, they built a story engine. It makes stories. It didn't use dice. Maybe, you know, you drew cards or whatever like that, but whatever it was, like you, you, you can see it. It's like, oh, it's dealing with the same archetypes. You have the king's queen, death, uh, you know, society crumbling, uh, people's individual bad decisions, uh, the influence of greed, you know, all of these archetypal human experiences. Um, and so I think when you're dealing with those things, if the games actually knows it's dealing with those things, then there's no deeper for it to go story-wise. You can get more detailed. You can get infinitely detailed um, and you can have infinite variation within that. But like, I, I, I don't think... Research wise, I think I'm at the end, like um, only because like underneath this is just not dualism, which is where the game's pointed anyway. But it's, <laughs> it's it, that's the end point of the game, too. Like it's not like there's not another game beyond that, you know. I, I, I don't want to be uh, yeah, too, too disturbing, but I, I think there might be a layer beyond the archetypes but uh, i i don't know if it's relevant but that, <laughs> um so okay so yeah fair enough like like uh i i think you're functioning on the level that you need to function in in the game design uh although we might talk about this other layer and, and how that's applicable to the game design uh, mm -hmm. later um so then when when you're when you're done making this game right mm -hmm. like 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 how, how do you like what, what's the ideal way of, of of you finishing it like like what would you like uh, the end product to be uh the end product would be a physical copy probably on kickstarter i would say um i, I mean i have i have commissioned art already there's or I've done for the game already. There's um, a considerable amount of writing I've done, although it's also a considerable amount of writing I've chucked away. Um, you know, and I put those archives up. So, like, you know, if, if people are interested, like, you know, the version of the game that I that I went through and um, wrote and put together as PDFs and um, you know, did full layouts for like they're all on the Discord server that, that exists for the game. So yeah, we'll uh, provide a link. I'll provide a link. Uh, so uh, th yeah, they're they're available. You can see like the the course of the work. How you know, <laughs> even the Google Docs have have the original date still on them. Like so, so you can see like going back to like 2011 or wherever it was when I was first dicking around with the ideas. Um, yeah, going forward. Going forward, I, I, my, the last two months of my life have been just so tumultuous that I don't, I was really planning on launching the Kickstarter this fall, but I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, you know, I, I was really hoping to have a fourth piece of art commissioned at this point, but I haven't been able to, like the artist has a project that they're working on quite furiously that's uh, bigger than what I've got going on. So um, there's there's some material barriers, and not really barriers, just challenges. Um, you know, I, I was really hoping to have a more finished 
script by the end of May for the opening, but just life has has uh, taken over in, in certain well you know regards. And it's lucky though because I don't have I don't have publishing constraints. I don't have like somebody breathing down my neck to get this thing out. And um, it's also useful to to be able to take my life experiences and digest them and question whether or not the game could handle it. Like I'm going through this thing, like, you know, what, what, (laughs) what game mechanic is this actually activating? Like, is this, is, this is, 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 um, is this a result of apathy on my part or is, is it, is it creating apathy in me? Like, am I seeing something and then tuning out? Right. Uh, because like, I don't want to deal with that problem. That's, 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 you know, you can have, you know, so a certain amount of apathy is fine, right? Like you can't deal with everything, but when you build it up and build it up and build it up and tune out and tune out and tune out, some, there's going to be a consequence and just the game, the game seeks now to track those consequences independent of, independent of the guide managing them, right? The consequences should just sort of accrue, um, and build and uh, uh, oftentimes I feel like it's really hard to track story events and track like the greater flow of story. And so like to have, to have a system where um, it cares about the archetypal nature of the events more than it cares about the details is something that I'm also pushing towards. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, you're using it, the game to grant your own experience as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And grant my own experience. Exactly right. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, if it doesn't work on me, then it probably won't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> My mind went, went so many places there, but but that's that's almost like like a world view in some sense, right? Like you like that that's taking it one step further. I don't know if you. <laughs> oh it, yes, you know you're right. It is. It, it can. It, it's it's. Um, I want to stop short at world view, and I've been describing it to people as an esoteric mapping technology. Mm-hmm. So it allows you to map your own inner experience, um, and it doesn't tell you what kind of experience you should be having with those landmarks. It just says like, this is a force. <laughs> you have to deal with this force. Uh, you know, how you deal with it is up to you, but like the force is going to have certain responses. Uh, so that's, that's, what's interesting to me. Yeah. So the learning is like naming the, the, like what, like what force is coming up to me? I'm, 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 I have, I have this outside experience. Um, you know, let's say, let's say my wife is yelling at me. For, for some reason, I'm having this outside experience inside me. I'm having all of these extra things that are not going on outside, but like it's turning into like, oh man, should I care right now? Do I want to yell back? Do I want to shrink into myself and just sort of like uh, cower and let her have this moment? Do I, you know, what, what's, what's, is there a good response here at all? Or should I just shut the fuck up? Right. That's, that's another Thing you could do like so so um allowing allow it has to at least be able to account for the archetypal flow of story that's the thing so like what what should, like if the argument with the wife is like okay so now like there's there's a moment of conflict between between a couple the archetypal flow of the story is uh the couple has an experience where they get stronger or the couple has an experience where this is going to contribute to the end of the relationship. Right. And so, so the, the framing of how, how the game will ask you to sort of take the experience of the, 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 the encounter the, in this case, the, 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 the yelling match and um, uh, put it in one of these buckets and, and align it with, like, oh, I really learned from something from this or like, oh, this cost me a bunch, you know, and you, you're allowed to frame it in whatever way makes sense to you, but it's going to ask you that kind of 
that kind of framing question. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I I get the the sense that I I want to take it deeper, but that that's not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I I I do want to go back to this. Okay, so you, you want you want to do a Kickstarter, mm -hmm. right? Like so, so so what's your vision? Let's say you succeed in implementing everything that you want. Uh, like like what is what does the game do? Like, does does it get uh, appropriated as an optional course in high school? Like, 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 how do you see? Uh, the, the the my ideal, I think. Well, I, I have I have I have like the big ambitious crazy like scenario, right? And then yeah, I have that one. The, okay. Well, the big ambitious crazy one is it dethrones D and D as the thing people do with RPGs, basically, because it, it will it will consistently provide a much superior experience because it will always be meaningful. Like you won't show up to a session of Ashes of the Magi and, and come away without one, at least one meaningful interaction. Hopefully that's the idea. Um, and that the game really cares about you. Like it, it really cares, like I really care. So the game is gonna really care. Um, it cares about what the players want out of the game. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and it also asks them to want better things out of the game. So, so cause, cause you're, you're also designing it to, to provide something to, to the players. So, so mm -hmm. what would it be providing? Like, like how would that ideally look like? Uh, it would be providing a set of tools and an array of practices that could be implemented outside the game uh, such that the players have an overall improved life experience. So, uh, for example, one of the things that's been very helpful to me is circling practice. And that's just coming to terms with yourself in a conversation over and over again, right? That's the basics of it. Um, but the idea is that there's a, there's, a, there's a mechanic in the game that asks the players to do this as a matter of playing the game, right? You, you, you're, you're kind of interacting with other players, you're in this sort of web of causality and anything you do is, is you know, play, every, every other character is, is hypersensitive to because you're now inside this web where you're all like, causally resonating with each other you're all viewing the threads of fate yeah 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 you're all viewing the threads of fate at the same time and you're like ah right and so it's 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 total impact all, all all at once and so the idea is that the players learn to um discuss how their, their their characters are feeling about a particular thing without actually but only from the lo the local point of view without projecting so and which is a, a very helpful thing to do in a conversation when a conversation gets tense is to sort of drop back and like feel where you are in your body and feel like the sensations that come up and um, uh, allow yourself to have a more open perspective to other people. And so to the extent that that can be practiced in a weekly communal meeting, uh, it's my experience that that the the benefits accrued there uh, bleed out. So that's, 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 so the idea is not to, um, one of the things, one of the things I see a lot on Instagram nowadays is like these personal RPG journals where it's basically a journaling practice and uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, level up your own life. And it's like, oh, that's good and shit. But like it, People who aren't motivated to, to take that step aren't going to use that journal, right? And so like where you have something where there's a much lower buy-in where it's like come, come to a friend's house and just have a fun time, right? You don't like Ashes doesn't ask you to buy anything expensive. Like it's like you can get like a really crappy little composition journal. It's like, you know, two bucks or whatever like that. Um, even, the, even the dice, I even start out with only six-sided dice now. Uh, and add dice as the game goes because I'm I'm 
I don't know. I'm going to try that as an experiment, see how it goes. Um, but the idea, the idea being like, there's not a huge level of buy-in at the start. There doesn't need to be a huge level of buy-in. Um, I, I, in my experience, buy-in is created as soon as you ask, as soon as the players notice that the game cares about their answers. Then they're like, oh shit, we can actually move levers in this game. Like we can actually like fuck with it. Let's, let's, and then that, that becomes exciting. People become, like, that's my experience. People become inspired when they realize they can actually have an effect. Yeah. So you were talking about practices, uh, mm -hmm. the game providing practices. Like, would I imagine that as, as like a website where there's external resources that people get? I've been to, yeah, I've been trying to figure out how to do that. I mean, right now, if the practices are, part of the um what players decide on their magic being so when the, the player characters uh choose a, a schema for for their magic it comes with certain practices so like you know uh that are kind of tailored archetypally to where that is although it's not super tight they're all pretty similar they're like basically you'll have one that's a meditation restorative practice you'll have some sort of movement there'll be some kind of, um, um, uh, some sort of study methodology, some sort of communal coming together practice. I mean, there's, there's just a, 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 every arcana will have these things because, um, the assumption is, is that each one of these arcana had its own sort of society that, uh, was using it uh, a community that was using it before the apocalypse happened. And so like, there's already things you know about how to use it. And so those are the things that get handed to you as the player. Those Once you choose an arcana, then you get some things that get handed to you. And so the things that get- and, and you're expecting the player to act that out in the moment then? No, I'm expecting the player to notice that there's an array of practices. And then, and then to, to, to me mechanize those practices in such a way that the effect on the character is something that the player might want to enact in their real life. All again, all it's doing is giving them like a, a pathway to use the tool. It's really not like I'm not including a spe specific meditation practice in the game. So, so you're you're intending to point out in, in ways it's like, oh, there's an option here, there's an option here, there's an option yeah. here, and then like right, let, exactly let, because let there's the magic. Great. Yeah, there's too many options to include otherwise, right? Like I, mm -hmm. there's so many, there's so many types of meditation practices that work for people, but just saying like, here's the one, you know, whatever, wherever your particular proclivity goes, then this is where you might find the most benefit or well, yeah, the, I hope the, like this aesthetically. Well, you, you couldn't make it a life project in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. Oh uh, yeah. Sure. So, so talking about that, right? So you're five years in the future, you successfully finished the game part. Um, like it's, it's defeated D and D. Uh, so, so what, what are you doing, right? Like what's your relation to role-playing games at that point? Probably just playing Ashes and Magic with friends. Like, I mean, what do I, what the fuck do I need to do? Well, like, well I, yeah, you, you, you could develop the site and the community around it. You, you, you could say, well, like, no. a different game that I could design. <laughs> uh, you, you could go touring and inspire people to make their own games. Like, there's, there's many avenues that you can take to. Yeah, no, none of that's fascinating to me. Um, I'm, I, yeah. Like, I think once it's done, it'll be done. And then I can just tune out and just. <laughs> yeah, you believe that after years of struggle, it's like, okay, like, close that door. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I mean, that's, it, it kind of feels like that's what's happening. Like, I don't, I don't know, man. It's a, there's a weird, there's a weird phenomenon happening in my life where I, I haven't, I, I don't feel pulled to play these games anymore. Mm -hmm. It, um, I'm not like, I'm not like, because most of the games are, are still strongly dissociative, 
Like I, and that's not to say they're wrong or bad. Like I'm, I, there's a place for that. Like a, it's great to have a place to go when you're, when <laughs> you don't want to deal with shit. Like, and if it's a really low bar to entry and the effects of it are also, you know, in terms of other ways you could just dis- be dissociating quite mild, you know, like it's certainly a shitload better than heroin. Um, so, uh, I'm not, I'm not looking to like destroy the modality where people are just showing up to have fun, like just going to a movie to, you know, I'm not, there was a point where in this exercise where I was kind of like the asshole art filmmaker who was like, why the fuck are people even going to blockbusters, all these idiots, whatever. And now I'm like, no, no, no. I, that was just me rejecting me. That's just me rejecting the fun that I don't want now, but for other people, it's fine. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in shitting on other people's experience. Um, but what I am interested in is designing experience for myself that I find engaging consistently. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, it, it's tough for me right now because I don't have a consistent gaming group. I don't have that foundation. I don't have like an audience to bounce this off of consistently that is uh, not trying to critique it, but instead just trying to engage with it at, 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 at the surface, at not the surface level, but at just trying to engage with the thing and not trying to pick it apart or, or talk to me about how it could be better. Um, and so not having that group of people to essentially perform for has sapped a good chunk of the motivation from 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 the project because it's just not as fun for me personally um and i don't want to run it online like it, it's not designed to be run online it's uh it's designed to be run in person uh i i don't I personally don't enjoy online games that much. Um, even though I played them and I still will, like, I'm not going to say no. Like if somebody was like, Hey, let's go play that. I'm like, yeah, sure. But I know that they're not as That's fun. where the audience lies though. Right? I know. Right. And I'm, I'm sensitive to that. And uh, it's, that's a, sometimes, um, sometimes you need to tell the audience what they want. Yeah, no, no, no disagree. <laughs> so, yeah. So back, back to you. So, like, you, you just gave me the impression that, in some sense, you're outgrowing role playing, right? Like, because you seem to have outgrown a lot of them by taking the the design of role, uh, and. In, in some sense, you've also been replacing role playing with this this horrible term serious play <laughs> <laughs> right. in, in in your life. Uh, so so, you, so you're playing life instead in some sense, right? And, right. And, That's the goal and, of the game as well, yeah. Right, and and, and so in, in some sense, you're you're trying to create a container in which you you, you can play life again together with other people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we all have to go through, but 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 yeah, it's it's interesting that you you, you sense this this maturization uh, in yourself, and maybe I I can put on some experience that I've been having. So I've been watching series, and like like I've watched a lot of series in the last years, and now I'm, I'm participating on 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 the archetypal level, like in yeah. in the series where it's like, oh, they're acting this out, and oh, like they're doing this for this and this and this reason, and I'm like, like, I don't know if of the people who wrote that were actually aware of what they were writing. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> so so it's really 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 fascinating to to see that, and I'm. Uh, to also get sucked into that perspective, like that way of participation, and like I, I even uh, remember g- 
being kind of scared. It's like, like, do I really want to like see the world like this? Like, this is <laughs> yeah, right, really dude. It's up. Up. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Like, I I've had some experiences where I ser- I, I seriously considered whether or not I was having a psychotic break because it's like that when you when you sit in the archetypal view long enough and like the connections between the archetypes become clearer and you realize how you can't disentangle any of them from any of them and like there's a wholeness that pervades this the the structure that humans built to like hold all these ideas um or humans built it or it built us i don't fucking know um but like it, it's so it's so big and yet the, the 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 influence it has like can be felt in detail like it's fractal like in both directions like you were saying like it's just the structure of it's I mean, it was literally mind blowing. <laughs> the spirit goes through the mind. <laughs> it's fucked up, man. Um, like I, you know, I, I during the during the course of this game, of designing this game over the over, you know in my life at 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 various points, like I've I've been at the point where. I was ready to kill myself, like really like right there and didn't do it. And that's made it into the game. And then there's the point at which uh, I, I stopped considering myself an atheist and that's made it into the game. So I've had to include like these two intense, intensely archetypal experiences. You know, I have to reconcile them and, 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 and like you said, ground them in some way. And the only way that makes sense at this point is like these these huge archetypes, um, and to the extent that that gives me the grounding that I find useful to make sense of the rest of it, like why would I not want to share that, or share the way I got there, or share something about that so that other people could maybe see something, maybe they you know. I, they don't know what to do with the experience of, the, of, of something like that. And just, there'll be, if there's one kid somewhere that goes like, Oh fuck this. I get it. This makes sense. Then that's my job. That's what I did. Then I'm good. You know, like, and that's already happened in a sense. Like I already got that person. So like, I'm kind of like my, <laughs> my, my highest bar for the game has kind of been achieved already. Mm-hmm. Like it's already worked once on somebody that's not me. Mm-hmm. And so like, okay, good. It, it, it's functional at least. And so that, that, that means that that gives me more motivation to keep working on it when it feels like I, you know, it feels like I'm throwing my time down the drain sometimes. Yeah. Or so on. what that brings up in me is, is, is in sort of an inevitability of the archetype right like uh-huh. yeah it's the right layer right like it, it it's it's where you're gonna end up whatever system right like if you if you're gonna keep up digging long mm-hmm. enough like you're just gonna end up with, with these yeah these abstract uh structures well structures is not forms <laughs> or, or ideas yep. that that inform you uh and inform humanity right uh, as as the right level of exploration uh, explanation right and you said you can then go go back down into this to the details in the specific implementation right. um, yeah and, and that's a really ambitious project so uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and and that that's kind of why i'm also supporting it uh, thank you <laughs> completely well, insane I'll, i mean i acknowledge that like i'm, I'm not it, it I'm is completely insane but i like insane people oh good only the right kind of insane though <laughs> i appreciate it very much i appreciate the implication that i'm the right kind of crazy <laughs> uh so so yeah like do, do you feel like you you left something out uh 
in your story, like something you still want to highlight? Um, I, there are, there are, um, I will say that there are parts of the story that have uh, specific mystical content that I'm not including mm -hmm. because that is, Now, see, now I'm wondering what my what my uh, hesitation is actually based in. To we'll talk about that, hmm. it's fascinating. Um, what well, was it the decision that you made in advance? Not to talk about it, or did it just happen? Decision I made. Uh, no, uh, it wasn't a decision I made. It was a moment of desperation I was in and I sort of just sent a call out into the ether and something answered and that that I don't I still haven't resolved like what that means mm -hmm. or something so, so, so how, how does that connect to, to to the game uh well it's been helping like whatever that thing that answered me has been specifically like guiding me to do the parts that need doing. Like it'll, it'll, I mean, it's me, right. But it's feel, it doesn't feel like me. It feels like, like, like a, a, a autonomous, like something that has insights that I don't have yet. And it's shoving me towards them. And sometimes it shoves really violently. And it puts me in a situation that I'd really rather not be in. And then it asks me to be okay in the situation and then take it into the, in like, you know, how does this fit? Like, can you make this work? Does this work? Like it, it and it's, it's, um, it's mean, it's mean sometimes. Um, and it also, I, it also deliberately withholds things, which is, I don't know what to make of that. That doesn't make any fucking sense. Like if I'm me, am I del I'm deliberately withholding insight from myself and, and prodding myself until what? Like, why can't I just say it? Like, why, what is the, what is, so this is another thing that I'm trying to figure out like how this maps. Mm -hmm. So we'll figure that out. I don't know. Or I'm just crazy. Yeah, so so it, it's it's interesting that you know that it's withholding like that. How do you know that? Uh, be, well, because it taunts me. Yeah, yeah. Let, right. Let's let's not go too too, too yeah. much in, in the analysis, but 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 it it is it is interesting that yeah, like there's a drive there that that is pushing you forward, apart from. Your other motivations. Um, let, let's hope that it's good nature. Because don't, there's there's bad stuff out there. Be careful. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Yeah, well, I mean, it is one of the car. It is one of the gnarlier ones, from what I understand. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. What else is there to talk about after that? Uh, no, no, no that, that, that's that's a good note to uh, end on. So you have a Discord server. We'll mm -hmm. be adding that in the details. Uh, yep. There's a website. You can go there. There's a website. We'll also be adding that. Um, yeah. yeah, for, for me, uh, <laughs> well, I already said it. It's like bringing all of these things together. Well, there's another thing that you're you're bringing together as well. Um, it's been a fascinating talk. Um, I would like to invite everybody to participate in the comment section, uh, share your insights. Also, I think yeah, Rob would, would like other people to comment on his, his game. So I think that the avenue is op also open. Like Rob, do you want to plug some stuff or? No, nah, I'm good. I mean, the, the little links will be in the links. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So thank you for participating in the, the unfolding of the soul. Um, I would like to see everybody again in the next episode. Bye. Bye for now.